have got a special guest here on The Real Well Show today who's going to share how he went from being a janitor to buying his first rental property in college to now owning over $2 billion in real estate. Talk about scaling. You've probably heard of Ken McElroy, known as one of the Rich Dad Advisors. You may have also heard him at our virtual book launch last week. Well, we loved that interview so much that we decided to run it here on The Real Well Show. I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome. You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Rich and I asked Ken for an interview for our book, Scaling Smart, How to Design a Self-Managing Business, and he offered some great nuggets. You can check that out by buying our book, Scaling Smart, at Amazon or at the Bigger Pockets bookstore. The audiobook is still number one in new releases, so we're very grateful for that. Well, we asked Ken to also participate in our virtual book launch, and one of the questions we asked is if the quality of life has diminished as his portfolio has grown. In other words, as he got bigger, did life also get harder? His answer was no, I got smarter. While Ken has certainly put in the work and the time to grow his business, you'll be amazed to learn that he now just spends 90 minutes a week managing it. Ken's expertise spans multifamily properties, commercial developments, property management, and strategic investing, which he shares in this conversation. Beyond his real estate ventures, he's also a successful podcaster, YouTuber, and best-selling author. So here's the interview. Enjoy. Um, But Ken, you know, a lot of, myself included, uh, when I would think about growing and even scaling, it it's scary because it feels like more work. And most people already are busy and they already have a lot of work. So the idea of having more is like, oh, how am I going to handle more employees, more things, more details, more doors, all of that. So now looking at you, would you say that you were busier than when you started or less busy? Is it more, if if you were your younger self looking at where you are now, would you be like, oh, there's no way I can handle that big of a portfolio? Um, Like, what's it like to be in your position? Is it harder or easier? (laughs) Great. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I I actually had dinner with Robert Kiyosaki last night, and we were talking about this exact thing. Um, You know, when you start a business, well, most people, they they have what we call a busyness, right? Yeah. you know, and this happens a lot when they leave the W-2 job, let's say. And, you, you know, what they've done is they've replaced their W-2 for a business, but they're really everything. They're accounting, they're reception, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're writing emails, you know, they're finding properties, they're doing all this stuff. And that's normal, but uh, it's a lateral move. Um, and um, it is kind of the first step to building that base. Um, and And so... Um, I, I love the question, Kathy, because um, I think that over the years, you, you know, a lot of it's going to depend on who you are as a person. So what I mean by that is um, there are people that absolutely 100 percent need to be in control of every decision. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and those are the people I put in the accounting department. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> They're not entrepreneurs. Like, by the way, you need those people. Those are attorneys. Those are fact finders. Those are people that, those are, you know, so so. I, I guess the only reason I say that is because that's the right seat for them until they figure out that that's not how you scale or grow. So, um and so what what you what a what an entrepreneur has to do, it's been my experience, that you actually have to um, always be cognizant of the amount of workflow coming to you and say, is it really moving the needle of my company? And uh, and so yes, what happens I find a lot of times is people say, Yes, I can do that, or let me just do that, mm. or you know, let me just handle that. Guilty. And then the next thing you know. They're 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 consumed in the operations, and they haven't done anything to grow the business. And so, I've been guilty of it forever, um, and at times I'm still guilty of it. But it's always top of mind for me. So, um, and so what what happens is when you I believe the entire reason for a company is for me not to work, 
Like literally, that's my belief. I believe that it's here completely to provide a ton of income for me to be able to um, to do what I want when I want. So but it's funny because my uh, my mom, every single time, she's in her 90s now, same thing. Are you retired? You know, you know my mom. And I, as much as I love my mom, I'm like, well, mom, what does that mean to you? Like, like, you know, like, and so. <laughs> Great, good question. The, the, you know, for her as a hairdresser, it meant saving a bunch of money and, you know, having enough to live on with all the pensions and all the stuff that she relies on. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it means having a ton of money coming in in my company, but not having to actually be the rainmaker. Mm. Uh, and uh, and that's what I've built now. So so I, I run my my business on 90 minutes a week. Um, and um, it took me a long time to get there. And I'll explain how I did it. But but the but the, the, the what happens is um, if, if I'm if I'm if I'm doing things like like I'll give you an example. We just put on that great conference limitless. Right. Right. There, Which is awesome. <laughs> when I, when I, when Tarl and I met, the entire point for me was to find somebody who could run all the back end, right? Because that is by far the hardest job, you know, all the details on all that stuff. So that was a great partnership for me because I could have done, I could have done Limitless. I could have found somebody, I could have, you know, managed it and all that kind of stuff. But, and so what happens is as you move forward with whatever it is, even my publishing company, you, you know, I have, um, I have, a, I have a, a call with the girl who runs it for one hour a week. Um, and that's it. And, um, and, and, and so we save everything for that, for that hour. And sometimes I, I meet with her you know, once a month or something, it's, it, it, you, you know, the goal of every business in my belief is, is to provide a lot of money, uh, get the, the, make sure the margins are there and the cash flow is there, but not actually have to run it. So, so this is where partnering and all that kind of stuff help. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll give you an example. Uh, the building that we bought, um, it's 347 units uh, in Henderson, Nevada. I haven't seen it yet. I actually, amazing. I haven't even been to it. I That's literally amazing. haven't been to it. Like you, you know. But and you even have an airplane. <laughs> I know, but I, I have. I did look at the, you know, on our investment committee call. I did look at the numbers. Uh, I, I made sure they're correct. I've been around this business enough to know that I don't have to actually have to physically go walk a property when I have. We had, you know, a team of 15 doing that. I, so we did a full due diligence. I got a management company. We got in-house construction and all that stuff. So I had all the all our folks doing all the work. And they, you know, and, and we were going over all that. But I physically don't have to go. Back when I started, of course, I didn't have that luxury. So I could have. I could have spent a day or two. Um, you know, and so so I start to look at, like, the highest and best use of my time. Um, and then leverage the people. And so this is kind of back to the controlling factor. You know, I find that um, a lot of people enable and some people empower. It's a very different strategy, you know? Totally. So, and, and I, I love, I believe, I believe everyone is good. Like it, my company, like, I mean that, like, nice. I think that they all have a key some of them are harder open than others, but, um, you know, and, and so when you empower people, um, and you know, I, I've had to, I've unlocked people in six months. I've, and I've, I've never unlocked people in six years. So, you know, wow. what I mean? so it just is what it is, but you got to always empower them, empower them. And the minute they, you, the minute you enable them, which is what a lot of people want, because then there's no accountability or anything like that. They can point fingers and all that kind of stuff. Then what happens is they don't learn anything. They don't grow. They don't make more money, all that stuff. And what happens is that you find that they blossom. Sometimes uh -huh. they resist and, um, and uh, you know, they don't work out. But generally, I think most – and so so that's the way we run our business. And so so when I, when I set a team to uh, Nevada, I know them all. 
I know their capabilities. They've worked with me, with me forever. I know what they're going to give me. I know they're going to, because I've already done all this with them. You know, mm. years ago, I've already walked properties with them. I already told them what I wanted. And, and so so I get that stuff um, in a written form, and I trust the people that are doing it. And so for me, leveraging my time and all that stuff is the most important thing, because the last thing I want to be doing is you know running around with like a chicken with my head cut off um and i want to focus on what i think are you know like four of the main things for for the company um and one is the one is the financial returns whatever those are like those are really really important and i find a lot of people they do that after they get a financial statement and 60 days later you know what i mean mm. like so so <laughs> That's that's with the company. That's with the properties. Um, that's the first thing. The second one is the communication with the staff. You know, and the you know, like I was saying, empower and and enabling. The third one is the culture itself, because the culture um, attracts good people. Kind of like what I was saying before. Like you know, that's a really important piece. A really important piece. And then you know, and then you guys wrote about this in your book, the vision. You know, mm. the vision itself. I have to be out in front of everything. I have to set big goals, you know, like um, like good to great, you know, big, big audacious goal. You know, yeah. you have to set those out there um, and you have to be pushing forward. Uh, and um, with the right team, you can do it. And so I feel like my job is to go in and, you know, I have no direct reports, literally zero. And um, I have an assistant that, um, you know, uh, her and I have worked together long enough that she knows what's important, what's not. Uh, that's also training and, and empowering her to do things. Um, yeah. and, and, and then, um, you know, but I, I really want my time more than anything. Like, uh, I really do. And, and uh, you know, so, yes, I have this big company, but I'm, I, I want the next generation of people to run it is like, that your why now one, one of our um one of our attendees here put in the chat now what's your why of wanting to scale to get to the next level yeah. especially financially is it to add another 1 billion to your portfolio yeah so what, what's your why now ken well there, there's you know adding another billion is not going to change my lifestyle at all um mm. at all like it just won't however It'll change other people's. And so I am, I brought my two boys into the company recently. You know both of them. One of them has worked with me for two years. Another one just started less than six months ago. I nice. made them go, I made them go work uh, somewhere else after college. Um so very important. <laughs> yeah. So they came in and they're in two different roles now. So my why now is um my boys now get to uh I was in a meeting yesterday with my son. Uh, you know, for like two hours and, you know, and he's sitting there watching, you know, and, and, and learning. And, and so to me, that's, that's kind of my why at the moment. Uh, but also um, when we were, when we were building our core company um, um, in the last, let's say four or five years, uh, if you think about this, this is true. Most really, really, really good people hit ceilings in their companies, wherever they're working. So, you know, yeah. whether they're vice presidents or presidents, you know, and they're there 15, 20 years, let's say, or 10, and they're crushing it and the company's growing. There's owners of that business, and it, sometimes when it's not them, and um, they're, they're at a cap. Like the owner's like, holy shit, like I can only pay these people so much. <laughs> they, they know that. Okay, so so I went and found as many of those folks um, as I could, like literally, like on LinkedIn and you know, like national searches for all the positions that I wanted, and we hand selected. We had a lot of no's, and we found the right people. And so we we, we and how do we entice somebody like that? You give them a piece of the future based mm. on the momentum we already have. So, so, so the answer to the question is, why would I grow another billion? It's to it's to um, take these people that are now working for me, and and give them a chunk of that upside. Of course, I still have a piece of that upside too. Yeah. But but I've already got what I've got. I've got you know. So it's almost like you know. My buddy said it's like 
It's like old company and new company, right? So you draw a line in the sand and you say, okay, you got all the accounting systems and all the momentum and you got all these assets that we own already. You now, um, you now are going to get a piece of the GP, the LP, the this, the that, whatever, um, in addition to what you're doing. And, and now you all of a sudden you attract some of the top people in the industry because like, what am I really giving up? Like I'm giving up a, a you know, a slice of the future. Like how much do I really need? That's um, powerful. And, I love that. Yeah, so it's like giving them infinite returns, right? Like your correct. shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we just did. And that's the, those are the programs set for all of our, our people next. Um, and then we have a huge philanthropy uh, push uh, as well. And that's, that's a big one. We, we all, our whole company, um, was off two days ago at the uh, food bank. Uh, literally, we shut every property down, every company uh, office down, everything. And we all worked at the food bank. We have a volunteer day. And we have a full-time director of philanthropy in our company. So her entire job is to give away money. She, we, we, we donated to 72 charities last year. Incredible. And um, it's fully employee run. And so, so my why is, let's let, you know, I don't really... I don't know. I'm not a sit on the beach, read a book guy. So I'm like, I'm like, I I'm having fun, but I'm not really like stressing out about much. You know, I'm even the property we just bought was almost 50% loan value. So, uh, you, you know, like you, you, you stress out when you, when you take, um, your past and, and pledge it to your future. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, I'm just not going to do that right now, but I'm going to do it for the other people with the systems and the, and the assets and, and, the employees that we have. I love it. Awesome. Kath, I'm sure you have a question for, I just want to also put out to, to the group here listening and attending, uh, if you were having lunch with Ken or having dinner and you had some questions for him, go ahead and put those in to the the thing we'll we'll ask them and so kath why don't you go ahead and i got one question yeah. from someone here well first of all ken I, I know that the fact that you're here with us when you know you you could be anywhere we just really appreciate it so thank you for sure um you know i've been lucky enough to know you and to ask you what in the world was going on over the last four years because uh, I wanted to, I was watching everybody buy these multifamily properties and making millions, buying them, flipping them for millions more. And yet none of it really made sense to me. And none of our underwriters would approve any of it. And, and then, so I just thought, you know, is there something wrong with my underwriters? We need to fire all these people, you know? And then I would go to you and you're like, no, this is all garbage. So what was, uh, why did you say on the sidelines when so many didn't? And what what were the things that people did over the past four years that had them implode and grow too fast and get over their skis when the wiser um, investors did, didn't do that? And I'm talking specifically multifamily because we're a lot of our listeners are in one to four units, which was a very different story. And I think a lot of us dove in and have made lots of money over the last four years in, in single family because it has a lot to do with the loan, the difference in loans, right? So what were you looking at over the last four years that kept you on the sidelines? And what are you looking at now that has you diving back in? Well, I, I, I think I need to be a little bit harsh here. And I, <laughs> and if you boil it down to one word, it's, it's just greed. Yeah. I mean, let's just yeah. be clear. Like, yeah. to be honest, like, you, you know, you, you guys and and we, I, I, mean, I, we're, you know, we seem like we're the minority, but there's a lot of professionals that didn't buy, and and so why wouldn't we buy? We wouldn't buy because the only reason that people should buy, it doesn't suit the investor. Period. It, you know, the returns that people thought that they were going to do the underwriting that they were doing the price that they were paying the risks that they were taking they were it was all um, based on lack of experience lack of wisdom and trying to make fees to keep whatever they had going going that is the, that's the reality and and so now they would never say that but that is the truth because they were taking massive fees on the front end Correct. They, 
They right. went from like a $10 million multifamily and then were like, okay, I can buy a $100 million one when they didn't have the experience, but they got that fee. It, it, Correct. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I'm, you know, when that started, we were 20 years, our company had been in business 20 years, right? Uh, this is our 25th year. So I, 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 I again, if you're going to build, I mean, you know, you're, that's why I love your book, Scaling Smart. If you're going to build legacy and you're going to have something that's 50 years, 100 years, which is very possible for people, um, you, can't, you can't take all the goodwill and all the trust and all the systems and all the de decisions that you've made in the last 20 years to pledge it, um, you know, uh, when things are out of balance. And, and uh, don't forget, like, what we experienced was um, I never changed the way I looked at stuff. And I still don't. It's, it, you know, the math is simple, as you guys know, like, Math is math. <laughs> math is math. And, and so yeah. the, when the math started to not work, I backed I I I backed off. You know, when, when rates started to go up, I don't know, I don't really talk about this too much, but Ross and I did three cash in refinances. Like we wrote checks to hedge our interest rate. Like that's the right way to that's the right way to mitigate risk for your investors is, is um, you know, most people are like cash out, refi, cash out, refi, till you die, you know, the Burr model and all that stuff. And, and I have no problem with any of that stuff, but there are times where it doesn't work. And so, you, you know, so we we did a cash in refinance, which is my lender at Walker Dunlap is like, what are you guys doing? And I go, well, the, the, you remember they just raised it in the beginning, like I think it was a quarter point, like two years ago, let's say, I, I'm like, uh-oh. You know, inflation was six or five or something, and then it went up to nine. And I'm like, the Fed's clear; they, they want to get to two. There's going to be more rate cuts or more rate increases. And and uh, I'm like, we don't need that interest rate exposure. So we started doing cash ins, um, and and that's actually what you're supposed to be doing. Like, and, and so when when the rates went up like that. There's only one thing that can happen. If, if you have a property, a 200, 100 unit property, and um, it's running the way it is, and rates jump up and your mortgage paper goes up a lot, your cash flow's down, period. You know, it doesn't cash flow like it did. And, um, and so what people were doing um, is they were, um, when rates were going down, they were stretching for price. Um, and um, and that's what created the bubble. And that actually is what creates bubbles with 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 lowering rates. And I mean, on anything, you know, you, you saw it in the auto market is another really great example. When rates went down, you know, the car, remember the car dealers, you couldn't find a car, you couldn't get a car. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the same thing, like uh, exact same thing. And now fast forward, <laughs> you know, they can't, they, you know, they can't give them away. Uh, you know, the, and so it's the same. It, it kind of parallels real estate in a lot of ways. Interest rates create bubbles. And so that's why I think coming into this next cycle, it's going to be interesting to see what this does. There's two things that are going on right now in the market that I think are really interesting. One is there's about a million units hitting um, in the next year and a half, two years of multifamily specifically. So brand new, right? All over the place, yeah. Like wow. you know, in, in every in every city, every town near you, you know, like like you. And, and I love it because real estate's really dumb. Like it, you know, like you break ground two years ago and then you open, you know, a couple of years later, uh, you know, and and it, right in front of your eyes, you know, it's been going on forever, but nobody like goes, oh shit, two hundred units are hitting the market. Well, uh, you know, <laughs> if you would have been looking at, you would have seen that they started 18 months ago and um and uh, you know so all the supply is hitting okay so that is creating softness in rents it's creating it's better for the resident you know the, the landlords have been really um really uh blessed with these really high high uh rate uh you know in, uh, rent increases and all that kind of stuff that those days are over so so that's creating softness that's really good because, I mean, if you're a buyer, 
because if if the seller means that they have to adjust their pricing, they're not running at the way that they were before. Um, and then, of course, the higher rates, um, you know, are double whammy. And then, you know, we can get into all the expenses, too, with utilities and taxes and insurance and all the th all those are going up. So so everything's going the wrong way. If you own real estate, everything occupancy is going down. Expenses and, are going in multifamily, up. particularly yeah, in multifamily, and, yeah. and interest rates are going up. So those are those those are the three things that that. Um, and so, as a guy like me, I'm like, okay, all those idiots, they're not going to be buying right now. They're going to be having to figure out how to, you know, lick their chops from from the from the overpaying that they just, you know, and and that that'll come. You know, th th those deals are starting to come already. Um, and so now, all of a sudden, everything's repriced. That's when you go in, and again, back to the fundamentals, back to the math. So, um, and so that's why we're really excited, uh, even though it's a very soft time. A lot of people have not seen this, and this is nothing like, I'm like, I, I've been through markets where you're good, three months free on a 12 month lease, um, you know, and high marketing costs, and, you know, and, and, and even as you know, way back, you can go and interest rates are in the teens. So, um, you know, like, you know, the people that are freaking out are, you know, they're under 40, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, nice. right. So, so we got, um, just a minute before we wrap up here, we did have a couple of questions come in. I'd just like to hit yeah. these real quick before we, then we're going to take a, a 15 minute break. Um, I believe it's a 15 minute break, 10 minute break. Okay. Yeah. We'll be back, uh, 10 55 Pacific. Um, but one question, this one's top three book recommendations from each of you. I see a few on the shelf behind Rich, but I can't make out the titles. So let's just do one. What's one book recommendation that you would have that's either, that's had a big impact on you? Gosh, one, man, there's so many. I, I read so much. Okay, uh, do three you, then. <laughs> yeah, give it a wow. couple. Um, well, I think never split the difference is interesting because I got to use it right away with Chris Voss. Um, that's a really good book. Um, negotiation. Yeah. 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 There, I mean, literally, it, it just makes sense. It's like, you know, the standard. Um, hey, uh, I remember the guy said, hey, uh, we found a roof problem. It's 500 grand. And the the seller said. You want to split the difference? I just, uh, that's <laughs> just like, after you read it. No, I don't. That's a great one. And uh, anyway, uh, so I told Chris Boss he saved me like two hundred fifty grand on that one book. Wow, uh, nice. That's a great book for negotiating. Uh, it's not really negotiating; it's more of a psychological book. Um, totally. I love that book. Um, there's another book um, that I I used when I started scaling my business. Um, and um, you know the obviously the uh, the Turning Pro book with Stephen Pressfield, great one, is, is an is an excellent book. Um, and um, you, you know the um, the uh, you know, the then the other thing is we we study books like as a company. So every year I get a book. We hand Love it out that. to everybody, and we do a we do a full book study at our employee summit. Um, and there's a number of books like uh, the Habit Loop is another good one. You know, paying attention to you know what what you're doing from a habit standpoint. I don't think a lot of people do that. Like they get up in the morning, they do the same thing every single time, and then they leave for work at the same time, and they go and do the same thing, and they eat the same thing. So you know, so when you start to unpack that, you start to realize, um, you know, maybe efficiencies or you know, what are you doing to enable, perhaps, mm. or whatever it might be. So those are those are a few. Those are great, Ken. Thanks. And the ones that are on the shelf behind me um, that you can't see, one of those in the middle there is uh, a return to Orchard Canyon. That's yeah. that's Kenny's book, the one I mentioned earlier. Uh, Endurance is another one that's behind me, but. Um, as a man, as a husband, um, the, one of the books that's had the biggest impact on me is The Way of the Superior Man by David Data. It's really good as far as just, yeah, how, how you show up, um, especially with your significant other. Yeah. <laughs> that is a big recommendation, guys. That is uh, That just brought our relationship like to a whole new level. Hmm. Oh, awesome. so, All right. Yeah. Well, we need to wrap up. It's 1047. Kathy, do you want you want one book? Uh, just you... Science of Getting Rich was a, a, a mind uh, shift Science for me. Of getting and, rich, and yeah. Was that William mind. Waddles or something like that? I don't remember, but so good. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Awesome. Ken, 
Thank you, man. <laughs> My pleasure, guys. Your knowledge. Hey, Appreciate it. On a great seminar. I wish you success. I know you're going to crush it. And, uh, and thanks for having me on. Thank, Thank you. you so much. See you Anytime. soon. See you, bud. <laughs> Bye. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you'd like to learn how to scale your own business, be sure to get a copy of Scaling Smart, published by Bigger Pockets and also available on Amazon. I'm Kathy Fedke. Thanks for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show, and we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.